Ladies and gentlemen, your reaction. This is England Broad Street Pump. Epidemiology begins. Extra extra part two by channel extra credits. Yes, I saw the part one of this. I guess a day or two ago. This is about the John Snow, basically a, a scholar, a scientist, I guess, who got most of his degrees in just one year, which is kind of OP as shit. And yet nobody believes him, right? Uh, every time he comes over, like, ah, you don't know nothing, John Snow. Get out of here. Even his teachers and academics, basically, right, who trained him. I mean, he got a PhD. Only way you can get that level of, uh, you know, knowledge is if you're training with the best of the best. And obviously, he's going to appeal his case to them. And these other people's telling you, you don't know nothing. You graduated me. You taught me things. All right. So, obviously, he's the only one who knows things, apparently. Uh, even though his, uh, uh, you know, his reasoning could be a bit off, right? Uh, because of how how this is happening, but he just landed right spot. Like it's something to do with the water. So yeah, obviously, no. Everybody thinks there is just some kind of it's just the air. Air is causing the issue. Air is somehow turning pe people sick rather than actually checking the you know root, which is like you know contaminated water, which we know is where you know cholera comes from basically. Uh, so yeah, I guess he's the first guy who you know found this. Right, and he's gonna it's gonna come up with some kind of a solution. So this is pretty important. And his uh, his findings on how to anesthetize people literally changed the game. So he's kind of an important figure, right? Not just because of cholera thing, but because of that too. So let's watch it. Last we left Jon Snow, he had failed to convince the leading scientific minds of his time that cholera was transmitted through fluid rather than through a miasma in the air. But he was far from done. In 1850, he became one of the founding members of the Epidemiological Society of London. This was one of the first scientific medical societies to explicitly look not only for a cure to a disease or a way to treat its symptoms, but also to study the disease itself. How is it transmitted? How does it propagate? What environmental factors cause the disease to break out? In understanding these things, they could help not only to cure a disease... Okay, first of all, this Jon Snow's case might feel like, oh, what the fuck, look at those people. But you need to understand, when, it, when it's uh, come to scientific community, right? Uh, every time right, there is anybody come up with some kind of answer, every time the community is like that, right? Uh, they are kind of like, oh, you don't know nothing. And, you know, they are always putting scrutiny on, you know, any findings. I mean, there's a positive side to this. Like, if everybody's basically just, uh, you know, trying to disprove you in a way, right, then you can actually find the absolute truth. Like, okay, even if you're trying to disprove you, apparently you were right to begin with. That's an absolute truth as much as you can get. So in scientists, people can be sometimes drama queens. I mean, obviously, not drama queens in your conventional way, right? This is scientists. These are intellectual people we are talking about. But still, right, people are going to disprove somebody. Just, you know, people say you don't know nothing and there's going to be findings, right? Right? There are going to be other people who try to research the same shit you're claiming, and eventually people come come across like, okay, wait a minute, Jon Snow was right all along. But also to contain it, or perhaps even prevent it from happening in the first place. So when cholera once again returned to London in 1854, Jon Snow planned to use all the tools his prodigious powers of logic availed him of to finally and definitively show that this disease which he had fought all of his life could be contained simply by keeping people away from contaminated water. But when the cholera outbreak of 1854 struck London, it appeared to follow no rhyme or reason. It was a primal force. It struck all over the city, and it struck across the class divide. So many in London, perhaps everybody in London except Jon Snow, thought it to be random. Some trick of the constitution or of some predisposition caused those who fell ill to fall ill, and those who didn't to stay well. It had to be an act of fate, or just dumb luck. But Snow had a hypothesis, and he planned to test it in one of the grandest statistical experiments done to that day. You see, he had his theory, the theory that cholera was transmitted through water, but even though he'd proven it to his satisfaction with his previous experiment regarding houses on opposite sides of the street, he knew he'd need further proof to convince the medical world. So, he began to look. He needed commonalities. He needed something to link the seemingly random spread of the disease with water. Then, while going through municipal records, he found it. Eureka! There it was, just sitting in the books in front of him, staring him in the face. The district he worked in had its water supplied by two water companies, the Southwark and Vauxhall Water Company and the Lambeth Water Company. Both of them drew mm. their water from the Thames River, but SNV and Lambeth had one key dissimilarity that would make all the difference in the world. One that may have been costing thousands of lives, but one we could barely conceive of today. 
You see, at the time, London not only had cesspools below houses and household waste running through the streets, but also a sewer system that flushed all of this waste to the nearest source of running water, the Thames. All of the city's sewage was pumped right into the river running through the middle of the city, the river where most of its occupants got their drinking water from. In a few years' time, this would get so bad that the smell of the river would be unceremoniously labeled the... <laughs> so, holy shit, all this water... <laughs> All this water, you know, waterborne, whatever, disease is like cholera, what is that, the typhoid. These are the reason why we, we don't dump sewage into drinking water anymore. Thank God, right? <laughs> I mean, imagine that today. Like, oh, wait a minute, that's how the system works, right? We just dump our sewage into any water source there is, even if it's drinking water. Because hey, when it's just it's just large pool of water, yeah, everything's just going to dilute, I guess. Who cares? No, man, I care. So, <laughs> that's really fucked up to say for, yeah. The Great Stink, which leads us right back to the difference between Southwark and Vauxhall and Lambeth. What was it that Jon Snow saw right there in those books that caused his eureka moment? Well, S&V was getting their water from downstream of where the sewage emptied into the Thames, while Lambeth had recently moved their facilities above the sewage outflows. He had the perfect case study, Ooh. the perfect A-B test. If he was right about the mode of communication of cholera, all he'd have to do is compare the infection rate from those served by S&V to those served by Lambeth. He wrote, People of both sexes, of every age and occupation, and of every rank and station, from gentlefolks down to the very poor, were divided into two groups without their choice, and in most cases without their knowledge. One group being supplied with water containing the sewage of London, and amongst it whatever might have come from the cholera patients. The other group having water quite free from such impurity. So, Snow began to canvass two of London's districts that had recently been hit hard by the epidemic. At first, he thought it would be simple. He would go door to door, asking if anybody at that residence had been afflicted, and what water company they used. Simple. But nothing's ever that simple. Most residents didn't know what company they used. They were just tenants. They hadn't contracted the water for their place. Okay. Mm, what could he do? Ah, the landlords would know. Armed with this thought, he traced the tenants back to their landlords, then used official documents to trace the landlords back to their homes scattered Some throughout detective London. detective shit right he there. He madly dashed about the city, knocking on doors, standing in the hallways of the rich and powerful, asking mad questions about water companies and properties they didn't even remember they owned. He was closer, but he needed more. <laughs> hmm, what about the water it's- <laughs> Do you know your property in this district, in this place? Where you get the water from? Dude, do you see this mustache? Do you really think I know anything about that? I just own shit. I don't know. <laughs> I'm rich. Self, could the water tell him where it came from? <laughs> Perhaps now he was a madman, possessed of his errand, trying to make water talk. But talk yeah, that's it how did. science works. He ran a chemical analysis <laughs> on water samples from each of the companies and found that SNV water contained four times as much salt as the water from Lambeth. He raced back to all the houses whose water source he couldn't yet ascertain, and, surely seeming mad, asked them for a thimbleful of water, which he then put in a test tube and brought back to his lab. And with that, he had it. His records were complete. 38 of the 44 deaths that had occurred in that month had come from the S&V water. You were 933% more likely to die just by having the wrong water company pipe water to your house. There it was. That is strong that was shit. the answer. And that's yeah. what he would have found out if he had just had a few more weeks to analyze his samples and tabulate his data. But he was a doctor, and his old foe wasn't going to let him rest that easily. Cholera struck again. At first it was a rumor, then a few isolated cases he might be able to ignore. Then on Tuesday morning, the 4th of September, he opened the paper and read these words. In Broad Street, on Monday evening, when the there hearses came round to remove the dead, the coffins were so numerous that they were put on top of the hearses as well Damn. as the inside. Such a spectacle has not been witnessed in London since the time of the plague. He was needed in a place called Broad Street. Yeah, and really, yeah. I mean, and really, his case and <laughs> Johnson's case is kind of similar, right? They have expertise, but none of the superior cares about them or, you know, want to hear about them. Yeah, always un unappreciated. But yeah, holy shit, that uh, scenario where, you know, in horses, the coffins were on top of each other. Like, goddamn, similar thing happened, you know, in the current uh, pandemic that just, you know, went by in 2020, right, in COVID. <sighs> there were way too many, you know, piling up corpses and coffins and shit. Damn. 
I mean, I bet most of us uh, don't even remember that for the very reason that we don't want to remember that, right? But when you really think about, remember that time when you see see those news, uh, uh, you know, news feeds coming up, like how much things like that is happening. That was really fucked up. But yeah. All right, well, that was the England, the Bo England, the Broad Street Pump uh, by the channel Extra Credits. Yeah, this series is really good about uh, the cholera and uh, water, basically contaminants. Uh, this had it, this probably had the main effect of you know making sure that drinking water and sewage water doesn't mix going forward, which is the best thing ever, right? <laughs> God damn! You imagine that, right? They just dump the sewage water in the Thames River, and we'll just take drinking water from that too. So, you know, Thames River is much bigger, right? It flows is much bigger. I mean, who cares about somewhat sewage? Yeah, apparently biology cares. But yeah, All right? I'll see you next time.